Bless your name. Bless your name. Bless your name. Bless your name. Father, we bless you. God, we glorify you. We thank you, God, that you are worthy. And there's nobody like you. We exalt you in this place. You are high and lifted up, and there's nobody like you. You are the only true and wise and living God. No one came before you. None shall come after you. For you are Alpha and Omega. The beginning and the end, first and the last. And it is in you that we live, we move and have our being. And so now, God, we pray, Father, in the name of Jesus. Holy Spirit, that you would have your way in this time. Thank you for this time of worship. Thank you for your presence in this place. Thank you, God, for how you've already met somebody. And supplied a need even in this time of worship. Pray now, Father, in the name of Jesus, for open ears, eyes to see. What do you say unto your church on today? So much is happening in the world. So much is happening in our lives. But, Lord, we know that you still sit on the throne. And so speak now, God. Preach your word. Declare your word. Teach your word to us. That this may be a life-changing, life-altering moment for each and every person here. We glorify you. We expect you to do exceeding and abundantly above all that we ask or think. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen, amen, amen. Turn around and hug somebody before you take your seat. Just love on somebody. How many of you all know somebody uh, that is usually here today, but they are out of town for Memorial Weekend? Raise your hand. Raise your hand. Raise your hand. All right, this is what I want y'all to do. We're going to troll them. I want you to take a selfie and send it to them now and say, church is amazing. You are missing it. Can't believe you gave up God for a vacation. Just, just really lay it on thick. You know, cannot believe you forsook the Lord to have barbecue. Go ahead, go ahead. Not for real. Y'all think I'm joking. Go ahead, for real. <laughs> send, them a, send, send them a selfie. It's okay. Just have somebody behind you act like they falling out. Just like, you see Brother Johnson behind me. He unconscious. The Lord is moving so mightily. It's good to see you guys. It's good to see you. Amen. Love you all. And we are closing today this series on worship. Has this series blessed anybody? Series on worship blessed anybody? Uh, what I want to do for five minutes, maybe not five minutes. Let's just do three. Are there any three questions, three questions that anyone has on the series, anything about worship, something you don't understand, something that did not make sense to you. I'm going to take three questions. Are there three? Anybody? Don't be ashamed. There's no stupid question. If something didn't make sense, you want to know what? All hearts and minds clear? Who, what? Oh, you. What's your question? So his question was, he said, a couple of weeks ago, I said, you don't use praise as a weapon. He said, but that's kind of what he do, does when he feels like he's being attacked. He goes into praise and worship, and um, that's what helps him through, right? That's your question. So the question is, how is praise not a weapon? 
So when I made that statement, well, uh, praise is not a weapon. The reason I said this is this. Praise is our response strictly to the Lord for his goodness, who he is, and all of that. That's it. That is what praise is. The reason praise is not a weapon is because you cannot wield praise. All right? Now, the reason I say that is you can give God praise, but if God does not respond to your praise, your praise has no power, which means you can't wield God. So we can't make God do what we want to do. And there's, there's an example in the Old Testament. I think it's 1 Samuel 4. Let me look and see real quick. 1 Samuel 4. Your question going to take two people's questions time. 1 <laughs> Samuel 4. Don't turn to it yet. Let me find it first and make sure that's what it is. Bam, 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 bam. Yeah, here it is. 1 Samuel 4. I'm going to read it to you. This is, this is part of the basis, too, because when you get into praise being a weapon, then sometimes, and I know there are many, and TJ can probably t tell you, too, there are many praise and worship leaders all over the country who would strongly disagree with me. Now, the thing is, we're not at odds on the core, the essence of what both of us mean, but I think it's dangerous when we're not aware of words because when you start saying praise as a weapon, it suggests that it's something that you and I control enough to manipulate and fight against the enemy. And then it takes away its intended purpose, which is praise to God. That's like saying that the chair is a weapon. It can be a weapon to fight off somebody, but that's not its purpose. But let me, let me read this to you. First Samuel 4. First Samuel 4. Y'all can write down. You can turn to it. Write down. First Samuel 4 says, and the, and the word of Samuel came to all Israel. Now Israel went out to battle against the Philistines. They had camped at Ebenezer, and the Philistines had camped at Aphek. The Philistines drew up in a line against Israel, and when the battle spread, Israel was defeated before Philistines, who killed about 4,000 men on the field of battle. And when the people came to the camp, the elders of Israel said, Why has the Lord defeated us today before the Philistines? Let us bring the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord here from Shiloh, that it may come among us and save us from the power of our enemies." So the people sent to Shiloh and brought the ark from there, the ark of the covenant of the Lord of hosts, which is enthroned in the cherubim. And the two sons of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas, were there with the ark of the covenant of God. As soon as the ark of the covenant of the Lord came into the camp, all Israel gave a mighty shout. They, they, they go into praise. So that the earth resounded. Earth responds. And when the Philistines heard the noise of the shouting, they said, what does this great shouting in the camp of the Hebrews mean? And when they learned that the ark of the Lord had come to the camp, the Philistines were afraid, for they said, a God has come into the camp, and they, are, and they are against us. Woe to us, for nothing like this has happened for. Woe to us. Who can deliver us from the power of these mighty gods? These are the gods that struck the Egyptians with a very, every sort of plague in the wilderness. Take courage and be men, O Philistines, lest you become slaves to the Hebrews as they have been to you. Be men and fight. So the Philistines fought, and Israel was defeated. Defeated, and they fled every man to his home, and there was a very great slaughter. Now, this is one of the script, base scriptures for why I kind of disagree with that terminology, uh, because you can, you and I cannot manipulate His presence, and we cannot manipulate and make our shouting do what we want it to do when we want it to do it. They started losing, and I mind you, this is the same group of people we talked about a few weeks ago. Remember we shouted, and they was going, and they sent the praise team first, and they shouted, and all the enemies scattered. They did the same thing at another time and got beat up. Because you cannot, you all hear this, uh, understand the essence of what I'm saying, though. Praise is praise. When you and I go through tough situations and trials and we say, no matter what I'm going through, God, I'm going to give you praise in this. I'm going to give you glory in this. What happens is God decides in his wisdom and his own th thought process what to do for your praise in that moment. He may just step down in the praise and give you peace of mind. He may step down. He may change the situation. He may step down and never change the situation. The devil may still be whooping on your tail while you're in worship. He just can't be as bad. And he's not going to destroy you. He's not going to overtake you. But we see right here in this text, they went and grabbed the presence of God. 
and said, we lose in this fight. We know how to win. We did this before. Be careful you all having formulas of worship. Be careful having a formula of praise. That because I did this before, yeah, we a few weeks ago we shouted, and then last week I think we sat in silence and contemplated. You can't do both of those every single week and think you're going to get the same result. There are some times in life you're going to have to shout. There are some times in life you're going to have to sit in a room by yourself with some candles and just sit in silence. Sometimes you may go to a beach. Whatever it is, you and I cannot get to the place where we just start thinking we're going to make God's presence do what we want God's presence to do. And because somebody picking on us, you're going to start shouting in your cubicle at work, talking about the glory, and think God going to come in and just beat them up. No, that's not how it's going to happen. So that's what I mean. Does that make sense? Did I understand? TJ, was that okay? Okay. So that, does that make sense to everybody, what I just said? So that's why I say praise is not a weapon. Praise is what we give to God, and what God decides to do in that moment of praise is what God decides to do. If he want to beat the devil up, if he want to make your situation worse, whatever he want to do, that's what he do. One more question, because he took two. Any other questions on worship, worship, worship? Don't be scared. You see, he asked. Anybody? Everybody good? Yes, sir. I knew it was another one. Great question. He said in Romans chapter 12, it says, offer your bodies as a living sacrifice unto the Lord. This is your true, um, I forgot the phraseology, but this is basically what we are supposed to do. And his question is, is that a form of worship or is that the form of worship? That is part of worship all the time. Does that make sense? So it is not a form of worship and it's not the form of worship. It is part of worship all the time. The first part of the series, we talked about Abraham, and that is one of the first mentions of the word worship in Scripture in Genesis. And Abraham goes to sacrifice Isaac. And that text tells us that worship is sacrificial. Worship is giving God everything. So when we get to this part of life, Romans is basically, and Paul is basically building the same point, that worship is giving God everything. It is giving our bodies Give your bodies to his service. Give our bodies. So even when you are, hear me, y'all, worship is not always simply just the lifting of the hands, the crying out to God, the silent tears, or listening to music. Worship can be serving. When you do with your physical body that that pleases the Lord, you are worshiping God. Worship is giving God every single thing you have. All right, y'all with me so far? That makes sense? Did that answer your question? All right. All right, let's get to today's text because y'all been coming with another question and then we'll. John chapter 4. John chapter 4. As we conclude this series on worship, John chapter 4, beginning at verse 20. John chapter 4, beginning at verse 20. When you get it, say, I got it. That was quick. John chapter 4, beginning at verse 20. I'm going to wait for some of the leaves to stop falling. Get it? Paige, Russ, you got, y'all didn't get it? Okay, okay, it's just me. All right, here it is. John 4 and 20 says this. Our fathers worshiped on this mountain, but you say that in Jerusalem is the place where people ought to worship. Jesus says to her, woman, believe me, The hour is coming when neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem will you worship the Father. You will worship, you worship what you do not know. We worship what we know, for salvation is from the Jews. But the hour is coming and is now here when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father is seeking such people to worship him. God is a spirit, and those who worship him must worship him must worship in spirit and truth. The woman said to him, I know that the Messiah is coming, he who is called the Christ. When he comes, he will tell us all things. Jesus said to her, I who speak to you am he. 
verse 20, our fathers worshiped on this mountain, but you say that in Jerusalem is a place where people ought to worship. Uh, if I had to put a title on this, y'all, I would title it uh, Greater New Mount Eagle Baptist Episcopal Church. <laughs> Greater New Mount Eagle Baptist Episcopal Church of the Holy Father. <laughs> Did you say I'm wrong? I love you. <laughs> uh, I hope y'all wrote that down because I'm not going to remember that for next service. Uh, when we talk about worship and when we look at worship, one of the uh, things that really pops in most people's minds is uh, where we worship. Uh, because typically, if we're honest, we're honest, and there's nothing too wrong with it. It's unbalanced, but it's not bad, so, so to speak. Uh, we spend most of our time when we worship, we primarily do it in the house of worship. We primarily do it in our churches. Uh, most people, that's just kind of how you're wired. You, you aren't really, no matter how much we talk about it, most of us aren't going to have praise and worship uh, at work or even at home. Or We're just not going to do that. We'll have moments of worship. We'll have moments where we'll talk to the Lord. But we kind of hold a lot of it in for when we gather together in this place and everybody kind of has praise and worship together. And so that's typically how it's been set up, and that's how it's been. And, and the problem with this is this, that over the years, you guys, people have begun all over, especially America, we've begun to exalt the place of worship above who we worship. Now, let me be clear when I say this. This does not mean you don't have pride in your church. It does not mean uh, that you are not happy about your church or you don't brag on your church. There's nothing wrong with any of those things. Uh, the problem becomes when you start notice a trend, uh, especially in America, where it is uh, more of a lifting of the church than it is of the Lord. Uh, we begin to celebrate the things the church has done. We begin to celebrate all the things our church is doing. We begin, to, and we just, and, and, and that's just how we begin to get wired, and that becomes the habit. And God is saying, now, 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 don't get too caught up in that. Uh, because worship has to be, watch this, worship has to go beyond the tangible. You all have heard me say that word before. It has to go beyond the tangible. It has to go beyond what we simply touch, see, taste, and feel. Worship has to go to a deeper place than that. You cannot have the truth of worship and not have the spirit of worship. And, and many times, you all, when we get stuck in the place of the tangible, we get stuck in the place of the truth, and it makes more sense if we go through the text, uh, uh, we begin to lift up the things that are tangible that we see that we believe are doing the work of the Lord. However, understand this, no one can do the work of the Lord without the Lord doing the work. Now, we can serve many people, we can feed the homeless, we can do all those things, but the Bible tells us it's not by power, it's not by might, but it's by my spirit, saith the Lord. So no matter what we do in life, no matter where we are, we have to always make sure that we are careful to esteem God and his presence above where we meet his presence. This woman in the text, you all, this is this woman at the well, many of you heard the story before, many of you may have not uh, but this woman is at the well. She's drawing water. Jesus shows up. It's hot. He's tired. He asks her for something to drink. They get into this conversation. It's a very interesting conversation when you read it. It's kind of hilarious at some points. Uh, but they're having this conversation. Jesus says, you know, can you give me something to drink? And she says, I don't think you know who you're talking to. And it's uh, not like in some, you know, bold, feminist, womanist way like, you know, how dare you ask me to serve you? I don't even know you do. You know, it wasn't that. Um, it was simply uh, she was a Samaritan and Jesus was a Jew. And so in that time, Samaritans and Jews did not deal with one another. Jews felt like Samaritans were dirty and nasty. And uh, they were like swine. I know none of us feel that way about any other group of people in this room. So it has nothing to do with us. Uh, but that's how this was seen. And so she, as a Samaritan, said, I don't think you understand who you're talking to. You know, you all don't talk to us. You know, you you all don't interact with us. And Jesus said, don't worry, girl, don't worry about all that. Uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm thirsty. And so they go through this dialogue back and forth. And so finally, watch this, you guys, and get into a conversation of worship and theology and doctrine, all right? And she says to Jesus, our, verse 20, our fathers worshiped on this mountain, 
But you say that in Jerusalem is the place where people ought to worship. First thing I want you all to write down is this. Keep in mind this. Always have an altar. Always have an altar. Or for some of them, always have a church. Always have a church home. Both the Jews and the Samaritans, even though they didn't get along with each other, even though the Jews did not like the Samaritans, they both recognized that God had told their forefathers that they should identify a place for worshiping him. Deuteronomy 12 and 5. Turn to Deuteronomy 12 and 5. We're going to flip around a little bit today. Deuteronomy 12 and 5. Actually, I'll start reading in verse 1, but you can write it down. Start reading in verse 1. It says, These are the statutes and rules that you shall be careful to do in the land that the Lord, the God of your fathers, has given you to possess. All the days that you live on the earth, you shall surely destroy all the places where the nations whom you shall dispossess serve their God. So first thing he says is, tear down every place another God was worshipped. Uh, many times, y'all, mm, let's just leave it with our, our lives. Uh, many times we start building altars to the Lord and we've not torn down the altars to the other gods. Let me say real quick, real quick, it, it's, it's not uh, spooky, it's not weird. There are spiritual things that are not of the Lord. There are demons. There are all those things that happen in the world. They're there, okay? So when you just randomly grab things from other cultures and religions because it's cute and put it in your house because it looks nice. Many times you have unknowingly erected an altar to another God in your house. Now, let me say this too because some of you are like, well, I didn't know and that's not fair. Uh, I can take a bag of seeds outside and have no clue what those seeds are. When I throw them on the ground, whatever they are is what they're going to grow to. I don't have to know what they are. Just being ignorant of what you sow does not change what you reap. And many of us claim ignorance. God, I didn't know, but it's still, it's still an apple seed, so it's still going to become an apple tree, whether you read the label right or not. Be careful grabbing things that you have no understanding of what it is. So he says to them, destroy all the stuff that they had on the high mountains, on the hills, under every green tree. He said everywhere. You got that little voodoo doll under your couch that your cousin from New Orleans brought. <laughs> it's been under your couch for like three years. You can't never figure out why every time you sit on that couch, you pass out. Now just playing. <laughs> Child just gets so sleepy when I watch TV in the living room. Uh, okay, let me keep on. <clears throat> he said, you should tear down their altars and dash into pieces their pillars, burn it with fire, chop down the carved images of their gods, destroy their name out of that place. You shall not worship the Lord your God in that way, but you shall seek the place, verse 5, that the Lord your God will choose out of all your tribes to put his name and make his habitation there, there you shall go. And there shall you bring your burnt offerings and your sacrifices. Uh-oh, your tithes, your tithes. Let me stop for you. I'd be like, see, they go to them churches and preachers. And the contribution that you present, your vow offerings, your free will offerings, and the firstborn of your herd and your flock, and there you shall eat before the Lord your God, and you shall rejoice, you and your households, and all that you undertake in which the Lord God has blessed you. Check this out. You always need to have, once you accept Christ, once you are a disciple of Jesus, you should always have a church home or a place or an altar where you gather with other people to give God what God requires of us on a corporate level. 
Now, I know some of y'all be real deep, and y'all, you know, well, Pastor, that is the uh, Old Testament, and uh, the Old Testament was done away when Jesus Christ came, and he fulfilled uh, the Testament, and so I don't know if I have to uh, bend my wheel to the Old Testament when I am under the New Covenant. I am glad that you talked to me in that voice. Turn to Hebrews 10, 25. Hebrews 10, 25. Turn to Hebrews 10, 25 real quick. Hebrews 10, 25. That's just for y'all deep people. No, you know what? Start at verse 19. I'm going to read verse 19. Hebrews 10, verse 19. It says, therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain that he is through his flesh, and since we have a great priest over the house of God, notice the language is still here, let us draw near with true heart and full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience, and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope or faith without wavering, for he whom promised is faithful. And let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day drawing near. Verse 25, forsaking not the assembling of yourselves together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, all the more as you see the day drawing near. <laughs> New Testament. You still are not, as Christians and believers, to forsake the assembling of yourselves together. Now, what we do together slightly changes in the New Testament, but there's still a, 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 a weight placed upon gathering together. Here in Hebrews, he said, look, y'all need to gather together. You need to get together. Uh, some people don't. But we need to get together as the day draws near, as the world gets crazier. You need a place that you can gather with people that are on the same page as you. A, 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 a place where you know everybody believes Jesus Christ is Lord. A place where you know people believe in the power of his name. A place where you know that God still sits on the throne. A place where his name is still on the place and on the people that gather there. A place where people know I can call on the Lord and he'll save me. A place where people know that if two or three are gathered together in his name, there he shall be in the midst. A place where people know that if we lift our hands and give God praise, that he inhabits those praises and liberation comes and freedom comes, a place where you don't have to worry about somebody worrying if you're a Democrat or you're a Republican, if you black, if you white, if you Jew, you Greek, if you slave or free. All we know is you are a brother and a sister in the Lord, and I don't care what your background is, but when we gather together in this place, it is all about him and nobody else. That's why you can't come into church worried about what people think about you, how who's looking at you. Anybody that's looking at you funny ain't your kin. Just know, oh, you ain't related to us yet, uh, but I'm going to give them praise with my kinfolk because they know why I'm about to run around the church. They know why tears are rolling down my face. They know why I keep calling the name of the Lord. They know why I keep reading my Bible. They know that this thing is a fight and that the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they are mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. I need somebody in the room with me that I can grab your hand and say, the devil is trying to destroy me. Pray for me. I know somebody that can say, God God, I call on you for my sister. I call on you for my brother. That's why you can't be out there by yourself willy-nilly thinking you can take on the world. Sometimes the army got to get together and give a shout. Let me keep going. Let me keep going. They both knew. They both knew. They had to worship somewhere. Have a church. Have an altar. Verse 21. Verse 21, John 4, Jesus says to her, woman, <laughs> it's so funny Jesus says woman like that. I, I want to try that one day. <laughs> I 
God has not given me a spirit of fear, but a power. Wisdom. Yeah, it's true. You gave us wisdom. All right. See, this is why we gather together so somebody can speak sense into us. Jesus says, Jesus says, verse 21, woman, believe me, the hour is coming when neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem will you worship the Father. First point was have an altar, have a church. Second point is your church and your altar can't be the altar. So we just had a whole conversation, a whole conversation about both, both groups knowing the need for an altar, the need for a place of worship. We saw it in Deuteronomy. We saw it in Hebrews. Jesus comes right behind us and says, that's good. That's really good. That's good. But time is coming real soon where it ain't going to matter where your church is. It ain't going to matter who your pastor is. You all, it, it, it is, hmm. It's a very difficult thing, separating pride and worship. It's a thin line between having pride in where you worship and worshiping where you worship. Uh, when you have an indication that you have exalted your place or your church or your altar above your God, when you reference your church more than your God, let me tell you, there, there, there's, 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 there's order in the church, and there are responsibilities for each level of leadership in the church. And so when I'm about to say this, it does not negate the order or the responsibilities of leadership. Uh, those of us that are called to be elders, those that are called to be teachers, preachers, pastors, evangelists, apostles, all that stuff, we all have responsibilities that equal the level of our leadership. Y'all with me so far? So if I am a pastor and I pastor people, then you are a responsibility. It's my responsibility to feed his sheep, all right? That's my responsibility. So it is nothing wrong with you asking of your leadership to provide what is their responsibility. Y'all with me so far? Everybody with me? It becomes problematic when you... Elevate your leadership to a level above their pay grade. I, 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 I struggle sometimes. Let me, let me be transparent or opaque. Let me be opaque for a second. <laughs> I, I struggle sometimes, and those of you that have ever sang or led or taught or preached, you, you might have the same experience. Uh, and I appreciate there's a side of me. When people come up to me and say, oh, my God, Pastor, that word changed my life. Oh, my God. Oh, you just do it. Oh, oh, oh. There's a part of me that's like, oh, I really appreciate it. I like, I hear it. I like, I, you like to be told you're doing a decent job. You know, you like, you like to be told that people appreciate what you do. But then there's a side of me that, that struggles because in my head I'm saying, but I didn't do anything. Now, now, it's my responsibility as shepherd to feed you. It's my responsibility as shepherd to the best of my ability to put uh, systems in place that we don't lose any of you, all right? But when you start saying, uh, Pastor, you healed my daughter. When you start saying, uh, I sent the cloth in, the $20 in to the, to the evangelist bishop on TV, and then money started coming, and you start giving back money to that evangelist bishop on TV because it's got to be him. Let me tell you, 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 you may not always stay at boss, and, and I'm okay with that. God moves people, God shifts people. Some of you will be with us for life. Some of you, you're here for a season. But let me tell you, if you ever are here just for a season and God transitions you elsewhere, whether you move, whether life just changes on you, don't be in places where preachers elevate themselves. 
if everything is about the pastor, if everything is about leadership, if everything is uh, uh, the oil, you know, the, that language, uh, the oil on my life and, and the anointing in my hands. And, 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 and no, 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 no. God is no respecter of person. And whatever he's done in your life, he can do in mine. Now, granted, you may have a different level of leadership because of the position you're in, but it does not mean your authority is greater than mine because they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. And so your title don't mean nothing if you ain't got the spirit of God. My God in heaven, don't y'all elevate anybody above your God. It don't matter. It don't matter where your church is. Have a church though. Let's keep going, let's keep going, let's keep going, we're out of time. Verse 22, Jesus go in on her, he about to go in on her. Jesus cold-blooded, y'all. He say, he say, woman, verse, verse 21, I gotta read it in one flow, because that's how you get the full. <laughs> woman, believe me, time is coming when it ain't gonna matter where you worship. It ain't gonna matter. But let me tell you something else, verse 22. Y'all don't even know what you worship. (laughs) This dude, Jesus, crazy. You worship what you do not know. We worship what we know. For salvation is from the Jews. Now, watch this, (laughs) y'all. The Samaritans did not know God. You say, well, Pastor, they, they, they picked a place of worship. They, they pulled some stuff from the Old Testament. Uh, well, the thing is, the Jews recognized the entire Hebrew canon, and that's why they chose Jerusalem. The Samaritans only recognized the Pentateuch, the first few books of the Bible. So they picked a different place to worship, all right? What Jesus is saying to her is, you all don't have the full revelation, and thus you cannot worship in truth. Uh, We're about to deal with truth. We're about to deal with truth. The Jews did have the full revelation of God in the Old Testament, and they knew the God they worshiped because salvation's truth came to them first, but they lacked the spirit. He says, uh, you don't even know what you worship. And many of us, you all, if we're not careful, we will end up in the same place where there's a line that is blurred between the celebration of our gatherings and the gathering of the saints. Where we begin to exalt uh, uh, these moments higher than the moments when God visits these moments. Y'all with me? Is it making sense so far? See, you, don't, you don't even know. You don't even know what you worship. Let me tell you the danger of being ignorant of what you worship. Being ignorant and not knowing. Remember, we talked about when we dealt with uh, Abraham that worship has to be intentional. And throughout the entire series, we've had points where we pointed out worship has to be intentional. Worship cannot be a last-second thought. Worship is something that you think through. It is not just some haphazard thing. It is not simply only an emotional response, but it is something you didn't thought through and you didn't say, this is what I am giving to the Lord as my form of worship, regardless of who's around me. But when you take out the knowledge of who you worship, It leaves you in a precarious place. What do you mean, preacher? I mean this. It is difficult for us to worship God for real and not know the Bible. You cannot say, I cannot say, we cannot say, we are worshipers. And you know four scriptures. And you've been a Christian 40 years. See, what we have turned into worshiper is how loud we are. How high we shout. How high we jump. Child, I'm a worshiper. 
Oh, when I hear that music, you know they talk with that weird voice, that, that, that whisper, I'm a worshiper. <laughs> oh, I'm a worshiper. Oh, when that music gets going, I just, I just go into worship. <laughs> Who are you worshiping? Oh, I worship the God of my Father. I worship Jesus. Tell me about Jesus. Oh, he, he turned water into wine. Yeah, yeah, that, that, that's a good one. What else? What else? Tell me some more about your Jesus that you worship. Uh, uh, he walked on water. Oh, that's a good one. That's a good one, too. Tell me more about your Jesus. Uh, 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 he, he gave sight to the blind. That's good. That's good. Tell me more about your Jesus. What does your Jesus say about adultery? Oh, oh. What does your Jesus say about fornication? What does your Jesus say about drinking? Does he say you can get drunk? Or does he say you just drink a little bit? What does Jesus say about where we worship? What does Jesus say about how he's going to change all of our sins into whiteness? How, how did he do that? Can you explain to me uh, how he did that exactly? Oh, the blood was shed. Where do you see that in the scripture? Can you, can you point that out to me? Oh, I know I know it's in there somewhere. Uh, it's, it's, it's somewhere. John 3, 16. Oh, baby, that's not... Yeah. How do you know who you worship if you don't read about who you worship? Y'all married folk or dating folk. How are you going to make somebody happy and you don't know nothing about them? I never forget. I never forget. What time is it? Now I never forget. I was trying to press this girl. And um, it was a long, long time ago. Back, back, back when I had to impress girls, you know, get older and get smoother. You don't have to do that no more. <laughs> I, I couldn't even, I couldn't even start not laugh on that one. Uh, uh, I was trying to press, try to press this young lady, try to press this young lady, and I got her a dozen, like no, not not dozen, like two dozen red roses, two dozen red roses sent to the job. I'm like, yeah. You I'm gonna, get, I'm gonna get points for this one. Send two dozen roses to a job, and I, then you, you know you just do something like that, and then you just wait. So I'm checking every five minutes to see if it's delivered. If it's delivered, it's delivered. It's like it says delivered. I'm like, oh, okay, all right, all right. Phone about to blow up. It's about to be like, oh my god, thank you. <laughs> no call, no text, nothing. So I'm like, okay, let me. Did I get the right address? Let me check the address. So I checked the address, the right address. I'm like, okay, is she off today? No, she's not off today. She ain't working on. Okay, so all this stuff runs in my mind. So that was like 2.30 in the afternoon. I hadn't heard from her at all. And it's like 9 o'clock at night. So I'm like, okay, uh, something must have went wrong. Her friend calls me like 10 o'clock that night and says, Hey, man. I said, hey, what's going on? You know, what's, going, what's happening? She says, you an idiot. I said, what I do? I so I told her, I said, no, I ain't no idiot. I'm, I'm cool. Let me tell you what I did today. I sent her, she said, two dozen red roses. Yeah, I know. We just leaving the hospital because she's allergic I didn't know. <laughs> she was a, who's allergic to red roses? I didn't know that was even a thing. How's that even possible? But how do you worship in truth and not know the truth? Romans said they had a problem. He said, he said because you guys have, have, have given over your worship to, to creation, to birds and four-footed things, and you have not any longer acknowledged God as God. And because you've given my worship, God says, because you've given my worship to stuff that you have no clue about, I'm going to give my power to something else. 
It says, y'all don't know who y'all worship. We know who we worship. But then verse 23, it says, but the hour is coming, and it's here, when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth, for the Father is seeking such people to worship him. So when Jesus Christ comes, he's crucified, he's resurrected, he ascends to the Father. At that point, this is when worship is unlocked for us and we can be true worshipers. True worshipers are those everywhere who worship God through the Son from their heart. True worshipers are those everywhere who worship God through the Son from their heart. Check out Philippians 3 and 3. Don't turn to it. Just write it down. Philippians 3 and 3. Look at it later on to go with that point. Verse 24 says this, God is spirit. And those who worship him must worship him in spirit and truth. First of all, God is spirit. It means uh, God is not physical. He is immaterial. He is invisible. Uh, Colossians 1.15, 1 Timothy 1.17, Hebrews 11.27 all testify to this reality. God is not visible. You can't see God. You can't touch God. You can't smell God. All right? He says God is a spirit. So those who worship him have to do it in spirit. And this word spirit here, you all, is not referring to the Holy Spirit, but to the human spirit. Jesus' point is that every person must worship not simply by external conformity to religious rituals and places, which are outward, but inward, based upon the heart and our attitude. That means the human spirit has to be what we send and what we pull from when we worship God. The things only travel equal distance from where they start. So what that means, when I say that, it means this. Anything that comes from your flesh can only reach the flesh. Anything that comes from your spirit will reach the spirit. Anything that comes from your heart will reach the heart. And many of us in many churches, many all around the country especially, we are giving God this, this response of emotion out of our flesh. And it is elevated and we celebrate the place that has given us the tools for elevation. So we celebrate the tools that give us the ability to have this fleshly response. And that's why slowly our worship shifts from worship to God. To worship of Greater New Mount Eagle Baptist Church. Because Greater New Mount Eagle Baptist Episcopal Church is a place that created the stuff I needed to have this release. So when you go to another place that's not like that, you struggle to worship. If you find yourself struggling to worship based upon the music that is played, then the worship has probably been from your flesh. I know y'all not going to like it. It's, it's Memorial Day. You're going to eat barbecue later. You'll be fine. That goes for even here, no matter what upgrades we make, no matter what things God allows us to do in the worship experience, it's all to enhance and to do and give God glory for what he's given us. But at the end of the day, if you all and I and myself and, and Karen and Sharon and Greg and anybody that's a leader here, if none of us can worship in multiple contexts and multiple situations with different types of music and different types of people, and the only common denominator has to be that you 
you know Jesus like I know Jesus, then we've not been in worship. We do not know the truth, and we do not have the spirit to worship him out of. You should not need somebody to pump and prime you. You should not need somebody on keys. You should not need somebody in a microphone to say lift your hands, and then you lift your hands. If it's in your gut, Jesus said to the lady, out of your belly shall flow rivers of living water. She said, but I have no way to reach down in this well. I have nothing to draw from. Watch this. Many of us are struggling to worship in spirit and in truth because you ain't got nothing to draw out of your well with. But God is saying, if you take your experiences, if you take what you've been through in your life and use that as the bucket and drop it down in that well, I'll pull up out of you some glory. I'll pull up out of you some power. You don't need anybody else but think back over your life and think about what I've done in your life and you ain't going to need a band. You ain't going to need a praise team. You ain't going to need a preacher. All you going to need is your mouth and your hallelujah because you're thinking about my God in heaven. Worship, 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 worship should come out of your gut. Out of your spirit. Watch this. Not just because of what he's done, but the truth of who he is. They that worship him must worship him in spirit and truth. Every head bowed, every eye closed. Every head bowed, every eye closed. Father, we need you like never before. Be with your church. This church, every church belongs to you. We are your body. It's in you that we live, move, and have our being. So, Father, we pray in the name of Jesus, forgive us for crossing the line of celebration of our church to worshiping of our churches. As individuals, God, forgive us for the things we've worshipped, the people we have worshipped. Lord, for many of us, it was never intentional. We, it was never in our heart of hearts to say, I want to worship this relationship or I want to worship this job or this money. We, we didn't intend to do that. It was never in our heart. But, Lord, we looked up somewhere along the way and found ourselves stuck before altars of gods we didn't know. But now, Lord, we repent. We turn back to you. Pray now, Father, in the name of Jesus, Holy Spirit, that you would restore in somebody that joy of their salvation. The person that wants to go deeper in worship, Lord, we pray now in the name of Jesus, Holy Spirit, that you would continue to challenge them, push them, pull them, make your word fresh revelation for them. Remind them of the many things you've done in their life. God, we pray that you even now begin to remove that cloud of uh, concern of spectators and who's looking and who's thinking about me. We pray, Father, you remove the spirit of judgment. That we would not judge other people's worship and how they worship. Thank you for the quiet worshipers. Thank you for the loud worshipers. Thank you for the running worshipers. Thank you for those that sit at the altar in worship. Thank you for those that simply read their word and worship. Thank you for all the many worshipers. All you care about is not the style, but that they that worship you, worship you in spirit and in truth. 
Let us be a church that worships you in spirit and in truth. While heads are bowed and eyes are closed, we extend to those of you that may not know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. If you do not know Jesus, but you want to know him, slip your hand up, slip your hand up. Nobody's looking around, nobody's looking around. I see you, I see you. You may lower your hands. We talked about being part of a church today, but the reality is as well, that's not a responsibility to after you've given your heart to Jesus Christ. If you've not given your heart to Christ, if you're not 100% sure that if you died tonight that your soul will spend eternity with the Lord, then it does not matter what church you go to. It doesn't matter what title you have in church. Each of us has to have our own relationship with Jesus Christ. So right now, those of you that want to accept Jesus Christ, I just want you to repeat this prayer out loud after me. The Bible says, if you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart the Lord Jesus Christ, you shall be saved. So if that's you, you want to accept Christ now, repeat this prayer out loud after me. Dear Jesus, I confess my sins. Come into my heart and save me. I believe that you died and rose just for me. Come Holy Spirit and lead my life. In Jesus' name, heads bowed, eyes closed. If you just prayed that prayer for the first time, raise your hand, raise your hand. First time, first time. I see you, I see you, I see you. You may lower your hands, you may lower your hands. When I say amen, those of you that just raised your hands, we are not going to embarrass you. We're not going to make you say anything. We're not going to make you give a speech, none of that. We're going to ask when I say amen that you will come forward. The prayer team is on my right and my left, and they're simply just going to pray with you for your next steps, pray for you. We're going to celebrate the choice that you've made. You are welcome. We would love it to have you as a partner here in this church with us. But this may not be where God is leading you to, and that's fine. But we just want to see you accept Christ, and we want to pray for you and cover you. So when I say amen, those of you who just prayed that prayer for the first time, please come forward. Don't wait. Don't hesitate. Just come on. Father, we bless you. We glorify you now. We thank you for all that you're doing in this place. We pray, Holy Spirit, that you would draw now those that you have saved and those that should be saved in this moment. We give you glory. We give you honor. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Come on, if that's you, you just prayed that prayer. Come on. Come on, that's you, that's you. If you just prayed that prayer, amen, sister, amen. Come on, boss, celebrate. All of heaven rejoices over one. Amen, amen, amen. All right, it's time for our offering, time for our offering. Amen. Uh, if you need an envelope to give your offering, raise your hand. If you need an envelope to give your offering, raise your hand. Raise your hand, raise your hand, raise your hand, raise your hand. All right, now, y'all, don't forget, don't forget, during offering and during the invitation, we ask that you all do not leave. Do not leave during offering and invitation. The invitation is because we just want to be respectful and let the Lord do whatever he's going to do. And we can see who's raising their hand and all that great stuff. Because uh, sometimes people raise their hand and they don't come forward. So our prayer team and others are still looking around to see. So it helps if there's no movement during that time. During offering, don't move because they may shoot you. It's just real simple. It's, just, it's really just a security thing. We just We want to make sure nothing is happening. Um, but in all seriousness, you guys, we live in a different world. We live in a different world. And um, people have shot up churches, robbed churches. It's just a different world. And so uh, I know we joke about it. I joke about it. But in all seriousness, there's a, there's a reason for it. And so we ask that during the offering, don't move, don't move. Even if you're not giving, you don't have to give. We're not chaining the doors to everybody give. Uh, but we ask that you don't move. Uh, listen, guys, I said this last week. I'm going to be saying it for the next few weeks. We are gearing up, and I want you to be in prayer. I know some of you are fasting still. I know some of y'all like fast. You still fasting? Uh, some of you are fasting still. Be in prayer uh, about how God will lead you to give as we prepare and we build up 
uh, to get ready to start investing in the vision God has given us as a church for the next five years. Again, uh, for some of you, that is a financial uh, commitment that you will make above and beyond your tithes and offerings. For those that do not have it, again, I don't want anybody feeling like, oh, it, no, it ain't that serious. If God has given it to you and he tells you to give it, then be obedient. If you don't have it and the Lord has said, you know, I want you to use your talents, I want you to use your time, whatever that is, uh, so that you can sow that and it's, it's just as good as sowing money. So don't feel like I don't have anything to offer. Uh, you do. But as we gear up for that, you all be in prayer about how God would lead you to start giving those that have it financially uh, and those that have time and talents. How would he lead you to give as we start preparing to move towards building the vision God has given us for the next five years. Amen. Lift up your offering. Let's pray. Father, we bless you. God, we glorify you. We thank you for these gifts. We pray that you would use them for the upbuilding of your kingdom. Be glorified now is our prayer. Do what only you can do in our finances, in our health, and in our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may give your offering at this time. A couple of announcements. A couple of announcements. Uh, meeting for the health and wellness ministry today, 1 o'clock in Carthen Hall after the next service. I know sometimes y'all come to 930 and then you go home and you forget this building exists until next week. Uh, but those of you that are in those fields of medicine or health or working out, all that great stuff, or you just are interested in being a part, please try to come back here at 1 o'clock for that meeting. We really want to make sure that we are growing spiritually, uh, physically, financially, in all aspects of our lives. And so uh, if you know your blood pressure high, you know, you know you've know, you been eating too much sugar and all that stuff, we want to make sure we all get ourselves together. Um, I'm trying to get in shape because I want to be able to run on the beach like Baywatch with no shirt on. In slow motion, you know. Uh, and so I get to, I got to work out and do some stuff. So I so all of us, all of us. So those of you that are um, interested, please meet us at one o'clock in Carthen Hall for that meeting. Also, don't forget uh, Sunday, the weekend of July second. The times of the service are changing. Set your clocks. Nine a.m. and eleven a.m. will be our new service times starting uh, the first weekend in July. Also for the summer, uh, we're going to be back at about 70 minutes for service. So you'll have time to go enjoy life and whatever you do in Sacramento to enjoy life uh, when it's 9 million degrees. Y'all yeah, know I add it. I up it every time. Um, and so that's what we're going to do starting July 2nd, that weekend of July 2nd. Also that first weekend in July, we will have communion and baptism again. Communion and baptism again. Um, somebody asked, we are having communion in June, but I just want to emphasize uh, that first weekend in July. And then uh, finally, uh, last thing I want to share with everybody. Uh, where is, is Lola here? Where's Lola? Is she over there? Oh, come on. Yvette. How many of y'all know Yvette? Everybody know Yvette, right? Oh, I wasn't, but I felt like embarrassing her. Um, Yvette, you all, is transitioning out of children's ministry. Now, she is doing that because we have tremendous needs coming up, and we trust and believe Yvette has the skill set and the strengths to meet those needs. It is a much larger need, and it's going to pull more from her uh, for the short term, but she can do it. Um, Lola, what's Lola's last name? Leeks. Lola Leeks is going to be taking over for her. And so you all, please... Let's celebrate Yvette. We love her. We thank God for all she's done. Amen. Those of y'all that got children in children's ministry, you need to really thank her because your kid's crazy. See, look, she got a children's pastor's heart. She's like, no, they don't, pastor. Yeah, okay. Uh, let's, let's stand, and as we get ready to leave out of here, we're going to pray for her. And uh, this uh, transition in our church for her and for Lola and our children's ministry and our volunteer ministry. Uh, and those y'all asking, that's what she's going to be overseeing. Yvette's going to be overseeing our volunteers. So no matter what ministry you are part of, uh, you will be under her. She's going to make sure you're celebrated, make sure you eat sometimes, make sure you're prayed for, make sure stuff is in order and structured and all that great stuff. And so let's, let's pray for her. Stretch your hands this way. Father, we bless you, God, and we glorify you. We thank you for all that our eyes have seen and our ears have heard. 
We pray now for our sister, for your daughter, your child, for Yvette. We thank you for her service to uh, your little people. Uh, you said in your word, forsake not, the, don't keep the children from coming to you. And so, God, we thank you for her uh, service and all that she's done for children's ministry. We pray now, God, for elevation in her life. We pray, God, that you would bless her and Eli abundantly above all that they can ask or think. God, I pray this be a new season, God, in her life that you begin to unlock doors and open many things for her that have not been opened before. We pray for Lola. We pray for our children's ministry. We thank you for the growth of the volunteers and for the children's ministry. We pray that you will have your hand in every decision we make, everything we do. Give her the strength to do what she thinks she can't do. For we know that all our power comes from you. Now, God, seal this word in our hearts that we may not sin against thee. Thank you now for all that you're doing in this place. Let the barbecue be good. In Jesus' name, amen. Turn around and hug somebody. Tell them happy Memorial Day.